welcome to church once again this morning. It's good to see everyone. God is good. And all the time, God is good. This month, we've been exploring the theme, the overflow of love. The overflow of love. Which means not just a little bitty love, but a lot of it. And this morning, we'll be talking about the forgiving love. Not the forgiven, but the forgiving love. Forgiving love. I'll start by saying this. What is a wound? A wound. Physically, a wound is when a person has been injured physically. And from the physical sense of the word, most of the times we see a physical manifestation of that wound. Perhaps, you know, with blood gushing out or trickling out, whatever the case might be. Or pains that you feel physically. And then you know that you're wounded. Because you were injured. In the emotional sense, we also get wounded. The interesting thing though is, most people are more aware of physical wounds than they are of emotional wounds. You can imagine a person carrying a physical wound to a battle. They've been seriously wounded physically and they are still going to fight a battle. They are already almost incapacitated. But emotionally, a wound also is when we have been hurt, grieved, or when we've been caused pain. That's an emotional wound. We're injured emotionally. You can't tell me someone that you love so much, that you depended on, failed you in time of need. And you can't tell me it did not wound you. No. Either you're being ignorant, or you're just, you know, uh, uh, being nonchalant about it. And that's what we're going to address this morning. And I'm believing God for healing. Praise God. Also, spiritually, people can be wounded. Again, a person can be injured spiritually. Because man is made up of spirit, soul, and body. When we are wounded in our spirit, it translates to wounds in our bodies. And in the month of May, we'll be going even deeper by the special grace of God. When we are wounded emotionally, it translates to wounds in our bodies. That's why you see people that are depressed and, you know, and which is just being in an extended state of being hurt. It many times translates to low energy. It translates to many things even on the physical realm as well. Praise God. In the body, God has designed mechanisms to help us heal, to help the body heal. That's why blood clots and, and many other wonderful things that I'll be wise not to go into because that's not my field. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. But the body has been made by God to deal with those kinds of things. In the same way, emotionally, God has put things in place to help us heal when we are injured. Every human being has been wounded. Whether you are aware of it or not, every single human being. Some are still wounded because their wounds have not healed. But some have healed. But every human being has been. In Luke chapter 17 verse 1. Luke chapter 17 verse 1. Jesus told the disciples, he says, It is impossible that offense, that no offense should come. It is impossible. Impossible means it must happen. 
whether the person is close to you or not, whether the person is your spouse or your parents or your sibling or your best, 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 best friend. You guys were born in the same hospital. You've been friends for 100 years. <laughs> the Bible says it is impossible that no offense should come. When it is very dangerous to remain wounded. It is very, very dangerous. In biology, there are, there are different types of illnesses that can come as a result of leaving a wound exposed and still playing around, but leaving the wound exposed. In the same way, it is very dangerous when we as believers, when we as human beings leave a wound untended, unattended to, and we still go about our daily duties. Without knowing, we'll leave a trail of wounded people as well because a wounded person will wound other people. We can only give what we have. You can pretend for some time, but ultimately... We can only give what we have. If you've ever been wounded physically and, 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 and iodine or, or other biological agents have been used to treat it, you know that when it is being applied to the wound, it is extremely painful, excruciating sometimes. But we hold on because we know that this is going to lead to healing. Many people do not deal with their emotional wounds. Because there's nobody there to restrain them when the pain is intense. But there's no way we need to go through that. I see many leaders, many heads of families, many spouses, many, many, many people. You can see that they are wounded. Because for years, they still keep referring to that event that took place 10 years ago that hurt them. In essence, they are walking cops. If they are not, if they don't pay attention. And God help them if they are raising children in that kind of an environment. I mean, the, the, the effect is just mind-blowing. A woman that got divorced and is still in pain, still wounded, and then raising the children in that kind of an environment. If you're not careful, the girls might not want to get married again. And you'll be wondering, what's wrong? Oh, pastor, pray. No, no, it's you we need to pray for. The, the, the effect of wounds are beyond our imagination. The analogy is simple. Use the effect of a physical wound. Imagine yourself still going around with that, with that deep hole, piercing hole in your leg. That is painful. And you're still going to work and still doing everything with that and still running, exercising and every single thing. That is unimaginable. But we do the same almost every day emotionally. Because we are faced to, afraid to face the truth. But God has brought us here this morning to deal with that. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, from verse 6 to 8, we, we see an example of a wounded leader in the name of Saul. This man was doing very fine. He was okay. And then all of a sudden, David, one of his, his constituents, one of his, the people, one of his citizens that he's leading, uh, uh, came and defeated Goliath. All right? Now, as a result of that, the women came and out of excitement, they began to sing. Oh, Saul has killed 1,000 and David has killed 10,000. That's, that's a wound. Because as a leader, he wasn't expecting something like that. could have easily just told the woman, hey, tell the commander of the army, tell those women to shut up, shut up right now. And then they move on. Change the song. 
But it just continued on. But then he was wounded and he never dealt with it. So now instead of pursuing the armies of the Philistines and their arch enemies, he began to chase after David all the days of his life. His focus changed. When we remain wounded, our focus in life changes. I'll, I'll just give you one simple example. If there is someone that has offended you and you've not taken care of it, you might be having a great day and doing something. All of a sudden, the person shows up or you hear their voice. What happens to your attention? No matter how much you try to pretend that you're still focused, everything inside of you is getting angry. The heart is beating faster. Can this person just shut up? I need to get out of here. Well, you know, your attention has shifted. The person has control over you. <laughs> Amen. Now, we don't have too much time this morning, but there are two types of wounds, and we mustn't mistake them for the other. One is a good wound. Some wounds are good. Some wounds are very important, and they're good. Because if we live our lives trying to avoid every kind of wound, we will never grow. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 6, Proverbs 27 and verse 6, Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 6, let's, let's read that together, one to go. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So it means that there are some wounds that are good. Another example is in Psalm 141 and verse 5. Psalm 141 and verse 5. Let the righteous strike me, it shall be kindness. And let him rebuke me, it shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it, for still my prayer is against the deeds of the wicked. So in essence... The Bible is saying that there are some wounds that are good. We need those wounds. If not, we can keep going down a wrong path. Whenever we are corrected firmly, it can cause, it can cause a wound. But the Bible is saying it is a good wound. Some people avoid corrections. They are afraid of being corrected because they don't want to be wounded. There's something that happens inside of you when you are being corrected. But the Bible says that is a good wound. It helps to set us straight. It's like a child that is being spanked and is crying. They're crying because they're in pain. In the same way, you cannot tell me if you're corrected. You don't feel something inside of you. But the Bible is saying that's a good wound. And we must welcome it because it will help us to grow. A good wound is one that comes from a sincere heart. The primary motive of a good wound is to save a life, not to take a life. A good wound brings upliftment and not embarrassment. A good wound is born out of love and affection. Love and affection. But a bad wound, on the other hand, is designed to kill and destroy. It is designed to embarrass a person, to bring an infection. That's, that's a bad wound. And a bad wound can be self-inflicted. It is not just from external force. It can be self-inflicted. And we'll look at that this morning. So a bad wound brings pain. It causes bleeding, reminds us of the past, it limits our speed, makes us to draw back, makes us to lose focus. I mean, we can keep going on and on and on and on and on. Let's read Numbers chapter 21 and verse 6. Numbers chapter 21 and verse 6. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they beat the people, 
and many of the people of Israel died. <laughs> you see, the venom of a snake or any poison, scorpion, whatever, according to scientists, a moment it gets into the body, it begins to travel to a particular destination in the body. And that destination is the heart. That's why if, if a person is beaten in the leg, for example, they'll, they'll tie it up and they can even say cut off that part of the leg before it travels to the heart. If the leg is cut off, they, they will not die. But if it, when it gets to the heart, they are gone. The goal of every bad wound is to get to the heart. It might still be traveling. You might still be fine. Still serving and still, you know, okay, you know, I can still love a little bit and all that. But the goal, if you allow it, it keeps traveling. And once it gets to the heart, then now the person is now corrupted. The enemy infects people, churches, and makes them lose focus. They begin to attack each other instead of the devil. In a marriage... When a wound comes in, they begin to attack one another instead of working together to build the family. Ever since a certain event occurred, you started to become bitter, leading to an infection. That shows that you are wounded. If there is any human being's voice you cannot stand to hear, you're wounded. If there is any human being on the face of the earth that you cannot help, if they needed help, you're wounded. If there is any human being on the face of the earth that you cannot love, if they need love, then it means you're wounded. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, one of the reasons why God loved David so much was, among other things, he was a worshiper and many things, he was a giver and all that. But this guy knew how to come to God and to bear his heart before God. Oh Lord, these people offended me. Oh God, this, oh God, that he was able to pour everything before God. That's what the scripture means. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. It's not there for us to hide those things. No, it's to bring them out. It will be, it will be painful at that moment, in that moment, but at the end of the day, we'll get healing. Can I hear you believing? Amen. Praise God. We're talking about the forgiving love. In essence, what we're saying is this. Because of wounds, we must learn how to forgive. That's one of the quickest ways to deal with wounds, is to forgive. I, I often hear people say things like, ah, you know, if a person does this to me, man, I can never forgive them. You know, uh, that person, I can never forgive. And I'm like, wow, you're a prophet. <laughs> you're already, you're predicting the future. That has never even happened yet. But they said, I say, there's nobody I cannot forgive. There is nothing anybody has done, will do, that I can never, ever forgive. You choose which end of the spectrum you want to belong to. It's a choice. Because Jesus said offense will surely come. And nobody knows the kind of offense that will come to them. Nobody knows. Yours might not be to be nailed on the cross. Yours might be false news stories that will just be spread across about you. And started by someone that is close to you. That can even cost you your marriage, God forbid. Cost people things that are dear to them. Only God knows. But Jesus said, offense will surely come. It's just like saying, you know, 
uh, uh, there's, there's a snowstorm coming and, uh, and power, power lights will be out and everything. So go have a, a, a touch light or something, you know, to keep you warm and prepare yourself. And there's a public service announcement about that. What would wise people do? They go and prepare themselves. In the same way, Jesus said, offense will surely come. So we that we are wise, what do we do? We acknowledge that, you know what? Every single day, there is a potential for offense. So I must be prepared. But many Christians are still taken unawares. Taken unaware. Because perhaps the source where it came from. Ah, I never expected this person to be. Did Jesus say it will come from only people you expected? No. Anybody, whether knowingly or knowingly, any human being is capable of causing offense. And if we want to walk with God, we must understand that and be prepared for that. Can I hear you believe in amen? In Mark chapter 11, Mark chapter 11, from verse 11, sorry, Mark 11, from verse 23 to 26. Mark 11. Mark 11, from verse 23 to 26. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Hmm. Wow, this is a blank check. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. It's wonderful scripture. So it tells us that whatever we declare in prayer, we can get it. But Jesus said something. And whenever you stand praying, and is a conjunction. Conjunction. It connects what he was saying with what he's about to say. It says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against the people you love, no. If you have anything against the people you hate, no. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Maybe this is why many prayers don't get answered. Even when there is faith. Well, pastor, I believe. I believe. Boy, Jesus said, and when you stand praying, Whenever you stand praying, if there's anything, no matter how big or no matter how small, forgive. So, in this scripture, now let's read verse 26 to the end. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. All right. Now, Luke 17, verse 3 to 4. In the one we just read, Jesus did not say they have to ask for forgiveness before you forgive. Did he say that? No. Jesus said, when you stand praying, if there's anything, you forgive. Whether they say, please forgive me or not, it doesn't matter. Because someone said, forgiveness is a gift that you give to people. Luke chapter 17 from verse 3 to 4. We see another account of this. Luke 17 verse 3 to 4. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him, which means... Tell him that he sinned. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. In the first one he said, if there's anything when you stand praying, forgive. Whether they ask for forgiveness or not. In the second place he said, if they ask for forgiveness, you have to forgive them. So which means, but you say, but, but, but pastor, I, I think, you know, the person is just taking advantage of me and, you know, thinking I'm stupid and blah, blah, blah. Jesus said, if they keep coming seven times in a day, we still have to forgive them. So which means when we link those two passages of scripture, we can see that whether people ask for forgiveness or not, God expects us to forgive. 
So we do not get wounded, which can lead to disastrous consequences. Without forgiveness, our faith can never work. When we are wounded, we cannot put our faith to work. It can never work. I remember when I first, you know, when I rededicated my life to Christ and became serious. There was a time it was one leg in, one leg out. But when I, you know, became serious. One of the things that the Holy Spirit took me through the first few couple years was these, these things. To deal with many of those wounds. Deal with many of those wounds. I went to a boarding house. For those that have gone through, we tell little stories now and we laugh. But in those, during those times, it, 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 was, it was not fun. I mean, they were wicked human beings. You'd be wondering, maybe they came from hell directly. Wicked people. They'll tell people to stay in the roof and stay there for days as punishment. <laughs> Don't pity me. I've gotten over it. Amen. You tell you to hang in the ceiling, hang on the ceiling, the fan, and while you're hanging, they break bottles on the floor. If you, if you drop and you fall, you land barefooted on the bottle. So even when your hands are shaking, you know, <laughs> you look down, you look up. I mean, my things you can't even imagine. And, and you'll be tempted to just sit down, and just sw- curse some of them and say, you and your whole family, <laughs> you never ever succeed. But so God took me through all these things. Some of them very big, some of them little, little things. Where someone called you names. And you were so embarrassed that it, it just, you know, it broke you. It broke something in you. At some point in our lives, and I pray today is that day for us, we need to face those things and deal with them so that we can live a fulfilled life. Don't tell me you don't know what they've done to me. No, no, no. You don't know my story either. (laughs) You don't know. You don't know the person sitting next to you. You don't know their story. You don't know. A woman was raped. I mean, you know, yeah. And, and, and she so forgave the person that she even wrote a book with the person. And so people are saying, oh my God, how can you ever? Be? No, no, she's wiser than most people. Because she knows that she needs to be set free. One of the survivors of the Holocaust, he said something at the trial of one of those that were, that were, that, that were, accomplices in making that happen. He said, you know, you imprisoned me once. I'm not going to allow you to imprison me again. That's why I'm forgiving you. No matter what you've done, that's because you cannot imprison me twice. The first time was physically. Now this second time, if I remain in unforgiveness, then you are now emotionally imprisoning me. And I'm not going to allow that. Praise God. I don't care how many confessions we make, the prayers, even go and fast for 40 days. If you don't walk in love and love forgives, you can never see your prayers answered consistently. God will just have mercy sometimes, but never. The faith will not grow. What are we saying? It means that we must have a lifestyle of forgiveness. You see, the moment a wound gets healed, then now you need to maintain good health. That's where the lifestyle comes in. But for some people, they need to be healed first before they now apply the wisdom on a daily and regular basis. Because some of us are more in tune with our emotions than others. But all of us still have the propensity to be wounded. There are some people, if you don't look at them a particular way, they get wounded because they are more in tune with their emotional part. They just need to learn on a daily basis how to forgive and let go of things. Oh, praise God. 
Praise God. Prayer and faith cannot work when there is an air of unforgiveness around us. Even Jesus had to forgive before leaving the earth. In Luke chapter 23, verse 33 to 35. Luke 23, from verse 33 to 35. Luke 23, from verse 33 to 35. Hmm. Oh, thank you, Lord. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, they were, there they crucified him. <laughs> you see, sometimes we say this word crucified. <laughs> but every now and then we need to pause to really take in what that means. Is there anybody, perhaps you were using a, a hammer to, to drill a nail and your hand got just hit a little bit, just a little bit? Anybody? Praise God. Was it a good feeling? <laughs> Nails went through his palms and his legs. And on the right hand and on the left, they were criminals. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for the do not know what they do. So even Jesus, even Jesus knew that he had to walk in forgiveness. He couldn't go to heaven with unfor unforgiveness in his heart. Even if it is justified. I didn't do anything. I don't know why they did that. I even healed all of them. I fed them. I, multi I did miracles, but look at what they did to me. Look at what they did to me. No. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You see, a wiser person is the one that knows that they ought to forgive people, whether they are sorry or not. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. And then on the other hand, the forgiveness we're talking about also extends to ourselves. It is not just forgiving other people. It is also forgiving ourselves. Why is this important? We will look at the scripture from Zechariah chapter 3 shortly. But you see, if you don't forgive yourself, there is no way you can have boldness in the presence of God. Because every time you come before God, the devil will bring pictures to your mind. When you're in the club and doing those things in those days. Or when you did this, or when you aborted the pregnancy, or when you stole that, or when you did this or did that. The devil will just keep bringing all sorts of things. Because that's his job. Condemnation. And for many of us, the moment those things begin to come, we just lose our confidence. And we just end the prayer. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25 to 26. Isaiah 43, verse 25 to 26. Please make a note of these scriptures. You can go over them yourself. Isaiah 43, 25 and 26. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions. And what else did he say? For my own sake. Who is talking here? This is God. This is God. I'll read that again. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake. Hmm. And I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. God is saying that he's forgiving us for his own sake. Jesus forgave the people for his own sake. People that forgive, you're not doing it for anybody else. You're doing it for your own sake. Even God said the same. <laughs> for my own sake, that's why I'm forgiving you. Because God cannot be God if he doesn't work in love. Hmm. So, we also ought to forgive ourselves. 
there are times we make some silly mistakes, we blow things, and you know, and, and, and whenever you think of what you did, you're just like, almost like, wow, how could I have made that stupid mistake? And you keep going back over and over, and you, it's almost like a CD that is, that is skipping. Many people don't know what that feels like. Because you were born in the era of the iPods. Amen. It's also a good feeling. <laughs> Praise God. But that, that's the way it seems to many people. But still, we need to forgive and move on. There, there are some mistakes that we've made in our lives that, you know, you're like, how could I have even done that? And you're tempted to just rain abuses on yourself. And some people do. Oh, I'm stupid. I'm foolish. Congratulations. <laughs> Amen. But the truth is, some of what they did was really, really bad. But the truth is, in order for us to move on and grow, we must forgive ourselves. Let's, let's read something that is very telling here. In Zechariah chapter 3, from verse 1 to 5. Zechariah chapter 3, from verse 1 to 5. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest. Joshua the high priest. Everybody say Joshua the high priest. Hmm. Standing before the angel of God. And Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And let's see why. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Let's see why Satan had the right to oppose Joshua. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. That's why the devil had the right. Because Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. And that's those wounds, the mistakes of the past, the sins that we've committed. Now, even more interesting, it says, Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. We don't have too much time, we would have acted it out. So, we have Joshua, the high priest, we have the angel, and we have the other people. So, Joshua, the high priest, the angel told the other people, remove the filthy garments from Joshua. And it was removed. But now, look at what the angel told Joshua. He says, and to Joshua, he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you. And I will clothe you with rich robes. Why did the angel tell him? Wasn't he there when the people removed the robes? The angel is telling him because you must have a revelation that you have been forgiven. If not, the devil can still keep opposing him. Even though the garments have been removed. So we must see that we are forgiven. You see... We don't need to do a context, uh, contest, rather. All things are possible, but we have done some crazy things, and crazy is relative. A man was asked, he said, what's, what's the worst thing that ever happened to you? A very wealthy man in, 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 in some country in Africa, extremely rich. He said the, the worst thing that has ever happened to him was he was driving, he didn't have his drivers, he didn't have security guards, and he had a flat tire. And we're waiting for the punchline. Maybe arm robbers attacked him or a snake came out. He said, no, I had a flat tire. And he had to wait there for a long time for the security guys and guys to come and fix the tire. <laughs> Amen. But to him, that was a very bad experience. So whatever we have done is relative. It's relative. We're all looking nice, dress well, but we all have a past. And it is best if the past is left where? In Vegas. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> left in the past. We leave it there. Don't bring it to the current. No. 
2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And we said this many months ago, but we bring, we put our old life on life support. We keep it alive. And we keep bringing it back and bringing it back and bringing it back and bringing it back. And it never dies. And we allow the devil to keep doing that over and over and over again. When you begin to get serious for God, you begin to serve him, you begin to do your devotions, and the devil keeps coming, you of all people. Don't you know what you did to that person's marriage? Don't you know what you did? Look at, look at, don't you, don't you? And, and they just say, ah, oh, I, thought, I thought God has forgiven me. Good news. That is not God bringing those things to your remembrance. That is the devil. Just open your mouth and say, Satan, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I have been forgiven. Isaiah 43 says, what we just read, that God says he has blotted out our transgressions and he remembers them no more. No more does he remember them. Even Paul had to forgive himself. You see, there are... Sometimes even the church, not in Cornerstone, but even the church, they, they act, they take the role of the devil. A person used to be a prostitute, okay? That's her past or his past because they are male prostitutes too. And now the person is now in Christ and now serving, singing. And someone says, ah, uh-uh, you. With that same mouth, with the same hand, did you say you like this and all that? And, and, and God is wondering, what are you talking about? This person is brand new. What are you talking about? But you, you, holier than thou, I know what you did. That you've not even asked for forgiveness for. Because you don't think it is big compared to the prostitute. But in the eyes of God, it is all the same. All the same. Of all people, Paul had to forgive himself. He persecuted the church. The Bible says in Acts chapter 8 that Saul was consenting to the death of Stephen. So he was an accessory to murder. When he was going to Damascus, he was going there to destroy the church, to drag believers to, and this kind of person is now an apostle? But that's why he said himself in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I have, have, have let's, let's, let's read that together. Philippians 3 from, from 12 to 15. Philippians chapter 3 from verse 12 to 15. Not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on. I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. Which means I know I am not perfect. Which means I make mistakes. Which means I know I have to forgive myself. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things which are behind. And reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the price of the upward call in Christ Jesus. In essence, Paul was saying that if I don't forgive myself, I can never be an effective apostle because I did some wicked things that you can't even imagine. Some people here have not even killed anybody, but all the devil keeps bringing to their mind is, oh, you know, ah, you, you, you give and you do not, your tithe, you know, it was shot by $1.50. And, and, and you feel like, you know, and because of that, their confidence is so broad low and you're wondering, what is wrong? <laughs> Ask God to forgive you and get up and move on. And for some people, they're even afraid of the sins that they committed and they don't even know they committed it. <laughs> they come to God and, 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 and there's, there's nothing in their mind and they're wondering, maybe, maybe today I did something and I don't even know. Maybe 
maybe. And they, their confidence is going low based on maybe. That's, that's, that's not the God we serve. If you're like that here this morning, and you know sincerely that you know what, I need to let go of things. Make that decision today. I've been in meetings where, by the grace of God, conducted meetings where people were crying and screaming because it's very difficult to let go of certain things. But that's where freedom begins. That's where life, real life begins. You can go to sleep so peaceful and so joyful and you can go anywhere you want to go. You can talk to anybody you want to talk to. Other people might be angry at you, but you are just enjoying your life. That is freedom. And it is possible. Shall we rise?